Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that has one question for you all. Have you ever fought a dinosaur? Because they can cause a variety of damage. Here is the captain. Dropping facts. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week we are featuring another good one. This one is called Ruby and it's an American Red Ale. This is a flagship beer from the folks at Fat Bottom Brewing. It's perfectly balanced, beautiful in color, and a fantastic blend of rich specialty malts. And most importantly, Ruby is delicious. Four out of five bottle caps is your garage grade. And let's give a big Ron Swanson please and thank you that goes out to Victoria T., in Denver, Colorado. Big we like your jib to Palmer in St. Louis. Next up, here's a cheers to Teresa Bauer in Parts Unknown. And a big shout out to Shelby in Friendswood, Texas. And I'm sending out a big cheers to my friend Greg McGuire, who is somewhere in the great state of Illinois. And last but certainly not least, we have Christopher in Enumclaw, Washington. Everyone we just mentioned, they helped us out with this week's beer fund. And for that, we got a full garage fridge. And we are forever grateful to all of you. Yeah, B-W-E-R-R-U-N, Beer Run. If you would like to support the show and uh, get some more True Crime Garage in your earballs, subscribe to our show called Off the Record. It's only on Stitcher Premium. And Colonel, that's enough of the BL snaps. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Sadly, today is 10 years since two little girls were taken, and now we sit here and we still are looking for answers. When we left off yesterday, both girls were already missing, and it was not looking to be a very good situation. It was very bleak. They had found the girls' bicycles. They had found one of the girls' purses in a location that was odd, in a location that they were said to not have been allowed to ride their bikes too. And this was a weird location too, because it also presented difficulties for an abduction theory. But based off of the result and what we know will be, abduction is the only theory that makes any sense here. Very quickly, we end up having some witnesses come forward that will help to flesh out our timeline just a little bit more regarding the day that the girls went missing. So witnesses started to come forward. One witness was a man named Robert Carpenter. He's an Evansdale resident who lived only about two blocks away from Myers Lake. Remember, Myers Lake is where the bikes were found. He came forward and told police that he saw the girls on Friday the 13th while he was out watering his yard. He said that they biked by him. They were on their bikes and biked by him sometime between noon and 1 p.m. This time does make sense in our general timeline that we have. Carpenter lives on Lake Avenue. And if this was the girls, if this really was the girls riding by, they were close to the area where the bikes were eventually found. We should point out, though, even though we have this witness, there's a chance that maybe he saw two other girls. Seems unlikely, but there's a chance that they were there were other girls that he saw that day, and he's just trying to be helpful. Definitely a possibility because it's a Friday, and it's in the summer, school's out, so very possible that a kid could be playing in the neighborhood. He's out watering his lawn. Maybe he sees several kids out there throughout the course of his day, and again, he's just trying to be helpful. But again, this does fit in with our general timeline that we're working with here. Another witness came forward, and this was a cyclist who lived in nearby Waterloo, who often rode the Evansdale Nature Trail. 
this cyclist approached police who were in the process of searching the woods and thick, tall grass areas along the nature trail. This is on Monday the 16th. So remember the girls went missing on Friday to the 13th. This gentleman sees the officers on Monday the 16th. By now with him living in Waterloo, he already has probably some awareness that this situation is ongoing. And he approaches the officers and he told them that when he was there previously on Friday the 13th, he had seen two kids' bikes on the nature trail, but he never saw any sign of the girls themselves. He says, and this is according to his statement, I saw the bikes lying on the path, and I remember it because I had to swerve to miss them. Remember, we described how those bikes were found on that trail, on that bike path, right. and that makes sense that this guy out riding would have to swerve or have to avoid hitting them with his bike as he's biking past. He said that he believed that this would have been before 1227 PM. And the way that he comes up with this time is he's basing this off of a phone call that he made to his daughter soon thereafter. And he's got the timestamp on his phone of that phone call as 1227 PM. So he says he believes that this was before that time. Well, this next eyewitness is actually going to be better than a traditional eyewitness because this is going to be technology eyewitness. Unless your eyewitness has a photographic memory like the captain does, this mm -hmm. is better. It's a curse, I tell you. <laughs> That's right. This is when we have investigators who are able to obtain surveillance footage from an old auction house. And remember, we referenced a Brovan Boulevard in our first episode yesterday. And this boulevard is not far from the home where the girls were before they left on their bikes. The footage that the investigators obtained in the part of the footage that is important to them in our case was rather short, but it catches a brief glimpse of the girls showing the two of them biking and passing the auction house at 1223 p.m., which is not long after the 12.15 time reported by Grandma, who said that she saw them biking around at 12.15. Now, there's a couple of weird things with this surveillance footage. And we reported on some of this in our original coverage in episodes 393 and 394. One thing is that the, the owner of this auction house did inform the police that, hey, the time is off on the surveillance footage. It's only off by eight minutes. So not a big, you know, discrepancy there. One thing I could not determine based off of the statements that have been released to the media and that were available to us is in which, which direction is that eight minutes? Now it seems more likely to me that the 1223 might be earlier and maybe it was actually 1231. And I only say that because we have grandma saying that at approximately 1215 is when I believe that I had seen them. And the captain and I will always warn everybody and throw the caveat out there to all of these times when people are trying to remember these things, they're never exact. So grandma could be off on her time as well. And maybe the auction house footage is from 1215. If the eyewitness is saying that they saw something at 1230, Okay, well, I'm going to put that in a window of 1215 to 1245. The other information that we have, too, is that the direction, according to the surveillance footage, the direction that the girls were traveling at this time, whether it be 1215 to 1231, would be they are heading in the opposite direction away from the lake on the surveillance footage. Now, they very quickly could have turned around. I mean, I remember when I'm out riding with my buddies, when we were kids, very often we don't know exactly where we want to go or it's some kind of debate on where we're actually going because we have, have nothing to do, nothing to, no place to, to be. And so we're just kind of out on a random adventure. And so there is the possibility that they could have quickly turned around. What I'm trying to point out here, though, is while all of this information is helpful, it's also really difficult to kind of sort it out because the eyewitnesses that have come forward, the surveillance footage is great 
because you know that that happened. You have it. You can view it with your own eyes. Law enforcement can see it and go, yep, that's the girls. Those are the girls we're looking for. And we know that it happened on this date in this approximate time, which we get get a window of roughly 16 to 17 minutes. Right. The troubling thing, though, is the eyewitnesses that are coming forward, they're trying to remember after the fact about what time it is that they witnessed something, whether they saw the girls riding or whether the cyclists found the bikes or spotted the bikes on the trail and had to swerve to avoid them. He comes up with 1227 as the marker on his timeline saying it had to happen before 1227 because I remember talking to my daughter and I believe that that phone call occurred afterwards. Right. I'm just trying to present a scenario here that all of these times cannot be accurate. That is correct, sir. That somebody has to be off on their timeline. Yes. And it could be just an honest mistake. Definitely. But it seems very difficult to me if the girls are riding in the opposite direction between 1215 and 1231, and this man says that I saw those bikes, had to swerve to avoid them, and it happened before 1227. So the the timeline is a little skewed and i think we have to take some of these these minute markers with a grain of salt and like the captain said i think you put them more into a window of time rather than give them an exact bullet point or marker well let's also think about the age of the victims they're they're pretty young and they're connected how they're related so some of these crimes you you have to look inwards first could they have been abducted by a stranger? Yes. Is this a crime of opportunity? Possibly. But we have to look in the inner circle first and, and then move out outward. Well, that's exactly right, Captain. What we will end up having, unfortunately, is that on Wednesday, December 5th, 2012, hunters came across two deceased bodies in the Seven Bridges Wildlife Park. This is near Redland and Brimmer County. This is a wildlife area that is about 25 miles away from where the girls were last seen. These two hunters contacted law enforcement officials at 12.45 p.m. on December 5th. So let's think about that for a minute here. So this is just under, what, five months? So five months approximately goes by from the time that they go missing until the time that their bodies are found. Now, it will take several days for law enforcement to come out and say that this in fact, and confirm for everybody that this in fact is the two missing girls that we did, we have recovered their bodies from this location, but very quickly law enforcement is quick to point out, look, we don't have any other scenarios of two missing victims that are young people in this area. So while we cannot confirm it until until we do all of our uh, proper testing and confirm everything properly, we believe this to be the girls. So it actually took about a week for them to confirm and, and make that statement to the media and to the press. But they didn't leave the parents hanging to sit there and, you know, be tortured that's what it would be. It would be torture to hear that we f- we found some victims. Okay, saliva mouth. We don't know if it's your your kid or not. You know, law enforcement was pretty frank with them, saying it would be highly unlikely, it'd be highly improbable for it to be somebody else. We, of course, know the statistics on this. According to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, stranger abductions, if this was, in fact, a stranger abduction— are the rarest type of case and make up only 1%, approximately 1% of the missing children cases reported to the NCMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Even rarer is the abduction of two children in broad daylight. In fact, the FBI, doing their research, trying to find similar crimes, could only find 15 similar incidents occurring between the years of 1976 and 2012. Now, keep in mind, 
the 2012 incident is the lyric and Elizabeth incident. So really you only have 14 other situations where two kids were abducted, believed to be a stranger abduction and in broad daylight. So with the perpetrator having no actual ties to either victim. Very, very frustrating. This is going to be, if in fact this was a stranger abduction, this is going to be an incredibly difficult crime, an incredibly difficult situation to investigate. And when I say investigate, I mean investigate to the point where it leads you to an actual suspect. Because unless you have witnesses that can provide you with a suspect, some kind of breadcrumb trail that will lead you to a suspect, the only information that you have that could potentially lead you to a suspect would be items that you would find at either crime scene. That would be the location where the bikes were found and the purse was found and the location where the bodies were found approximately 25 miles away just under five months later. If you don't find anything at those scenes that lead you directly to someone or someone's, you don't have a lot to go on. You might have evidence, but you need somebody to tie that to. You don't have anybody to compare it to because you don't have much of a suspect pool. Now, the captain's right. What you do here in any of these situations, and they did this well before the bodies were later found, you start with the people that know the victims the best, their family, their their intimate small circle, their social circles, and you fan out from there. And immediately, still when the girls were missing, we have a problem with one set of parents. Yeah, there's a problem because Lyric's father, Dan, has a criminal history. He does. Dan Morrissey has uh, several charges against him for possessing, dealing, and making methamphetamine. The other problem that we have is at some point early on in the investigation when the girls are still missing, Dan becomes, he's not cooperating with police anymore. In the beginning, in the initial stages, all family members, both sets of families, both of the girls' parents were cooperating with police. And at some point, Dan stops cooperating. This seems to take place when the police start accusing him. Now, we should be clear here, though. We have the information that's been released to the media or per the media. I shouldn't say released to because that makes it sound like it came from law enforcement. I don't know where the media obtained this information, but several news sources state that the parents all passed polygraphs and some of them multiple polygraphs. Yeah, I'm wondering if they gave uh, Dan multiple polygraphs polygraph test here's the thing though he could have just lost his head when they started accusing him some people can't handle that some people can't handle that and i don't think in my opinion that this points to guilt now i wish that he would have handled this differently i wish that he would have continued to cooperate because that is the only way that they are going to find out who did this to your child is with your help you not cooperating really complicates the investigation because now they're even more concerned about you. Yes, you have a checkered past. Yes, you are in trouble with the police. But if you look at the timeline, there's not really any time in this timeline for Dan to have been active or directly involved in whatever happened to these girls. It just, it just doesn't work out. So, the other thing that the police have to wonder about, though, is because of Dan's previous affairs and because right. of his activities. It puts him around a sh shady group of people. A bunch of, sh probably a bunch of shitty people. Yeah, shady, sh shitty. Sh shady and shitty. Yeah. And so could one of them have been involved or several of them have been involved? Now, I, I kind of look at this and the only way I see this as being a possibility or the most likely of possibilities that would lead back to Dan is that he likely has no knowledge of this, or if he did have knowledge of it, maybe it's some kind of abduction for ransom that went bad, that went just completely wrong and off the rails for some reason. I look at this captain and the thing that just makes me sick to my stomach is I look at this and I, I see 
what I think is probably a stranger abduction or an abduction of some type of predator rather than somebody involved with Dan or involved with the drug trade. And we do know that these things do happen. You know, when there's drugs involved, when there's money involved, a lot of bad things can happen. So I don't want to push it out side of the box and say it's outside of the realm of possibilities. Now we won't go through all of the problems with Dan Morrissey uh, in this episode because we covered it quite extensively in our previously in our previous episodes. If that's something that concerns you or something you want to look into, there's plenty of information there for you in those episodes. Well, the other problem here is, yes, stranger on stranger abductions, especially with two. You go, well, it's it's one percent. Yeah, but these girls have been, there's been a schedule. These girls go over, they play together, they ride their bikes. They're now, just think about that. This this person could could have known their schedule or known, um, could have been monitoring them for a while. Well, and if you have a situation where, let's pretend for a second that maybe it was a local individual that is responsible for this. And because of the way that the bikes are found, I think that that suggests to me that whoever did this has some kind of knowledge, some general knowledge, if you will, of that area. If it were a local, there's, we said less than 5,000 people. There's less than 4,700 people. There might even be less than 4,600 people in Evansdale at that time. If it was a local with it being so few people that live there, now you create a higher probability that that local knew one of the girls, if not both. Right. And if that local is some type of predator and did this horrific deed, even if he just knew one of them, he may have chose this result to avoid being identified for their abduction and whatever assaults took place. Because if it were a complete stranger, you still have the the possibility that this individual could let them go, drop them off somewhere, and not be identified if they don't know his name. You know, we, we, we of course would get a description because these are not very, very small children. They're 10 and they're 8. We would get some kind of description of his vehicle, his activities, what he looked like. Uh, we would get that information. Maybe he didn't want that out there. But it's uh, it's one of those scenarios where I, I feel like this drug business and, and Dan's problems, I feel like it's a, a big major speed bump in this case. Now, if they don't have a lot to work with at either crime scene, well, then there is no speed bump. You have to investigate something. And this would certainly be an avenue worth pursuing. Well, once law enforcement finds the girls, they're not going to give us much information. It's going to be very tight lipped, very similar to the Delphi investigation. Yes. They confirm that sadly it was in fact, Lyric cook and Elizabeth Collins that were located in that seven bridges area. We do not get told how they were killed. We do not get told about, sexual assault. We do not get told how long they believe that they were in that location for the only statement that we get after the fact here is we get this kind of vague statement of police saying, well, after we found the bodies and after we've run our, our forensic investigation, we do have a good idea of when the abduction took place. And we do have a good idea of when they were placed in that location where they were found. We don't get any kind of information on how long that they were held or how long that they were alive after the abduction took place. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, these things usually don't take a long time before the perpetrator or perpetrators are moving on to the process of disposing of the remains.
From cringing at the pump to getting an eye-popping check at your favorite restaurant, inflation is hitting us all where it hurts. It's time to start using Upside and earn cash back. To get started, download the free Upside app in the App Store or Google Play. Use promo code TRUECRIMEGARAGE to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. To claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside, just check in at the business, pay as usual with a credit or debit card, and get paid. You can earn three times more cash back with Upside compared to credit card rewards or loyalty programs. Cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon or other brands. I absolutely love Upside. It's so easy to use, and it's not too good to be true. I've used it, and it works. Upside, to me, is a no-brainer. I'm going to spend the money anyways. I might as well be getting some cash back. And with the money that I'm earning, I'm going to buy myself a new guitar. Download the free Upside app and use promo code TRUECRIMEGARAGE to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using promo code TRUECRIMEGARAGE. Download the free Upside app today. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Hotel, motel, Holiday Inn. Cheers. We stayed at a Holiday Inn in Nashville. And mm-hmm. For that, I feel much smarter. Isn't that what you're supposed to feel after staying? Oh, well, they gave my gave me my room for free for just singing that lyric. There you go. Well, probably the best tip that comes forward here in the best breadcrumb trail that we will get in this case is in the form of the following uh Witnesses. These are three separate witnesses that came forward claiming to have seen an older model white SUV type vehicle, which would be similar to a Chevy Suburban or a Ford Bronco based off of the eyewitnesses accounts. Three separate witnesses said that they saw an older model white SUV type vehicle parked on Arbutus Avenue, which is a street very near Myers Lake on the day that the girls disappeared. This story is a little weird, though, to me as well. With two of the witnesses reported seeing the SUV parked between two bike trail signs, the other witness told police that they had seen the vehicle parked near the woods on the east side of the lake, only a few hundred feet away from where the girls' bikes were later found. All three witnesses reported seeing the vehicle between 11.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m., on July 13th, 2012. Maybe that helps out the cyclist information that he provided saying that he spotted the bikes before 1227. What's weird about this information to me is that two of the witnesses came forward in the first few days of the search while the girls were still missing. The third witness came forward several months later and says that they waited and didn't come forward earlier because they just assumed that somebody else had already come forward about it. That's a weird statement to me. Is that weird to you, Captain? Like, I, I, you know, I waited a few months. I know these girls were missing. They're little kids, and I know that I saw something. But why didn't I come forward earlier? I just assumed somebody else came forward and told you the same information. Police never released any of this information until the third witness came forward. I find this to be all very strange. Why would this, and of course we're not going to get any information from law enforcement, but why would this witness think that somebody else would come forward? Did they see somebody else there that day? Did they know one of the other witnesses and were told, yeah, I already reported that to the police? Well, where was this eyewitness located at? Was he in the neighborhood? Because that would make more sense to me. Oh, well, I saw him in the neighborhood. I, I figured other people saw him in the neighborhood, too. No, these are these are all, all these three witnesses are reporting seeing a strange vehicle on, either parked on Arbutus Drive, sorry, either parked on Arbutus Avenue or parked near the woods on the east side of the lake. 
So they're not reporting seeing the girls or the bikes. They're reporting seeing a vehicle that was in the location of where the bikes are later found and in that location around the time that the girls may have gone missing. Even though their time is a little on the early side for our timeline for that day. They're reporting that approximately between 1130 and 1230 on that day. Here's the thing to me, Captain. I'm always extremely suspicious, and I think we all should be, of information that people come forward with placing themselves in the crime scene area and their stories don't make sense, right? That's why I question the cyclist with his time. Could he just be wrong on his time? That's prob- that's probably the situation. He's right. just wrong on his time and he doesn't mean any ill will. He's trying to help out the investigation. But we have another witness that comes forward months later saying, I I didn't come forward because I just assumed somebody else would would give you that information. That's when you want to know what the police know. Why would they why would they look at this person as a witness and not as a suspect? There must be something in that person's story that makes them a witness and doesn't put them under suspicion from law enforcement. And it could be as simple as remember witness A and B? Well, I was with witness B. And witness B told me that they told you this information two days after they went missing. So I didn't bother coming forward. I had nothing in addition to what they told you. That's the things that I want to know, because in my mind, I'm suspicious of that individual that comes forward months later. Why are you now putting yourself at the crime scene? Nobody else puts you there. And you have this information that would have been really important to us back then. So that's as concerning to me almost as much as the shadiness and shittiness around the father, Dan Morrissey and his shady, weird friends and associates. But also the thing, you know, I I gave kudos to law enforcement in this area earlier for all the activity that they immediately put into place. And I, I applaud them and will continue to do so on all those activities. They jumped into action rather quickly. The one thing that I think is missing from what I think should have happened that day is roadblocks. I didn't see, couldn't find any information that suggested that they set up any roadblocks at any time. And I'll tell you what, nobody's put me in charge of any missing persons investigation, but if they did, and if we're on the scene within an hour, 90 minutes after the person was last seen, especially a child, and we got bicycles lying on the ground, I want roadblocks set up. We talked about all those different agencies that got involved, the state police, the highway patrol, the sheriff's office, the nearby larger police department of Waterloo. They're already out in these areas. Let's set up some roadblocks and just let everybody know, hey, we're looking for two kids. One, have you seen anything? Two, do you mind if we look in your car or truck real quick just to make sure that those two kids are not in there? Gives you a list of vehicles. It gives you a list of license plates. It gives you a a list of people and how they interacted with you. And that would be very important because, like we said, this, this is a very small town. But even the surrounding areas, if you take all the surrounding areas, you're looking at less than 100,000 people. That's pretty easy to start sifting through the crowd. You go, okay, well, eyewitnesses saw a man. Okay, now you're you're at 50,000 people. Well, between the ages of this and this. Okay, now you're at... Yeah, at ten thousand people. You see what I'm saying? Like it's well, not only that. Within within a couple of days, we have these witnesses. At least two of them that came forward saying, "I saw an older model white SUV type vehicle, maybe a Bronco or Suburban." And like you said, if you have that list of vehicles that you created because of your roadblocks, you you could compare that. You could cross reference that with this new evidence or new witness statements that come forward just days later, and you go, "Oh." We were, we stopped six or seven vehicles that matched that general description. Here's the driver's name, or or here's the the plate. It was an Iowa plate, or it was an out of state plate. Whoever did this, known to the victims or unknown to the victims, I believe drove them out of the area rather quickly. And I don't think it's just because of where their bodies were later found that I, I I've come to that conclusion. I think that whoever did this wanted to get out of there with them i agree it's a small area less than 4700 people they did not want to be seen with these girls in their possession 
Well, and there's obviously things that, as an investigator, you would want to know how long were these girls alive for, how long were they taken captured for, um, or held hostage for. It's um, That would give you, I think, an idea of a profile of an individual or what kind of individual we're looking at. Yeah, and it sounds like based off of the few statements regarding evidence that they have, that law enforcement has, it sounds like they have a general timeline themselves that they're working from that would include probably not exact dates, but more roundabout times and dates to those different items of of when they were disposed of in that area, how long they had been there, what have you. What the big turn in this case comes on February 3rd, 2015. This is at another press conference that was held in Evansdale. And we have the chief of police, Kent Smock is his name. He declared that the, the focus of their investigation, the focus of their efforts from now on will be those familiar with seven bridges, wildlife park. And he states, quote, I think you will agree with me that Seven Bridges is extremely remote. We have no doubt that the person or persons responsible for this crime are very familiar with Seven Bridges. It's a very well-known area to the local community. Unless you just knew that area, you wouldn't just come across it. Obviously, whoever took the girls to that area was comfortable with that environment and knew of that environment. Yeah, I totally agree. It was also at this press conference that Smock informed the public that they did not currently have a suspect or a person of interest. Mm. It also sounds to me like they're kind of, without stating this, it sounds to me like the current state of the investigation, or at least the working theory, is that they were likely abducted by someone unknown to the victims, potentially a stranger. And we had several accounts of what were deemed to be abduction attempts that took place in that general area uh, within the Black Hawk County, and this being the month before and during the month of July. And we know that a lot of times that these individuals will make several attempts before they're actually able to pull off an actual abduction. So could one of those abduction attempts be connected to it? That's possible. 10 years in this case is not solved. And it's very similar to another case that hasn't been solved in five years. And that's the Delphi murders, both victims being young, female. Abducted in broad daylight, later found dead from public places. So right. many similarities. It's, it's like beyond bizarre to sit here and go, you cannot, you should not discuss the two together. Well, and family members with uh, criminal history and, and drug history. So by far the most popular theory in the Evansdale case is that it could be the work of a serial killer. And of course, on the internet, everybody's saying if it is a serial killer, well, then maybe they've already struck again and they struck in Delphi, Indiana in 2017. Now, less than a month after the murders of Libby and Abby in Delphi, Indiana on March 9th, 2017, we do have uh, Sergeant John Perrine from the Indiana state police who would attempt to officially dispel these rumors saying we've spoken with the Iowa authorities about the case, just like we've spoken to so many other agencies with their unsolved cases. We are simply comparing notes at this point. We do not have a connection with that case and that case, meaning the Evansdale case. Now, what I would like to take a moment and look at is you can take this one of two ways. And I think it's an interesting exercise for either way that you want to take this. And that is to look at the offender profile that was put together on the Evansdale case by the FBI And kind of cross-reference that with the post-crime behaviors 
that has been presented to us in the Delphi case on things that we should be looking for in that with that suspect. And the reason why I think that this is a productive exercise to do is for two reasons. One, you can look at and see and observe and think about the obvious similarities between the two crimes and probably what will be similarities to have an argument that they are in fact connected or if they are not connected, then we can get further insight into who our offender is. Because I think that likely our offender in both cases is somewhat similar to each other. We're looking for a similar type of offender in both cases, even if they're not connected. So the offender profile in the Evansdale case states that the offender is familiar with both Myers Lake Angels Park, which is so now they've they've titled Myers Lake. Uh, they've created a portion of Myers Lake that is Angels Park. So that's dedicated to our young victims here, that portion of Myers Lake. So the profile says the offender is familiar with both Myers Lake in Evansdale and Seven Bridges Wildlife Area in Bremer County. Well, this sounds very similar to Delphi, doesn't it? What are we told in Delphi? We believe that you are from Delphi or work in Delphi or have lived here previously. So somebody that would be familiar with the trails in the Monon High Bridge. Back to Evansdale. The suspect chose Seven Bridges because he or she was familiar with the area and knew it was secluded. Sounds a lot like the Monon High Bridge and the trails. Especially the bridge because the bridge was not was not a part of the park that was accessible to everybody. Meaning that you weren't really supposed to go on the bridge because there had it had some problems. It was dilapidated. And law enforcement has outright said that they don't believe that that's an area that somebody would just happen upon and that would, that you would walk into and feel comfortable with. They believe the offender is somewhat familiar with that, that general area and has been in that park on those trails on that bridge before. And Evansdale says the offender blends in with, and may be part of the Evansdale Brimmer and surrounding communities. Delphi. We believe you are hiding in plain sight. We believe that you are from the area or have lived here previously or work in Delphi. Back to Evansdale. The suspect likely used quiet coercion to gain the girl's compliance into leaving Myers Lake using a ruse or threats of violence. Delphi. Guys, down the hill. Quiet coercion. Likely a threat of violence in Delphi. Back to Evansdale, the suspect may have been experiencing stress related to legal troubles, spousal problems, employment difficulties, financial strain, or mental health issues in July of 2012. This is very common. This is a very common item that you will expect to see in other offender profiles. Usually, there is some kind of trigger that sets these guys off. A lot of times, if this was, in fact, a sexual predator, if this was a sexually motivated abduction, then this guy likely had fantasies, fantasies that he may or may not would act on at some point in his life. But there could be something that triggered him, something that pushed him over the edge into going from fantasy into acting it out, into carrying out these horrific activities. The suspect may avoid discussing the case or showing interest in the matter, but is likely following developments in the media. I believe I can fly more so in the Delphi case that whoever is responsible for that. I think they are, they are hanging on the edge of their seat and they are absorbing, reading, listening to. They should be consuming every piece of information that comes out in that case. Yeah. I'm not the only one that suspects that. Doug Carter told us all, we know this is about power to you, and we know that you want to know what we know, and one day you will. When comparing the two cases, Captain, the Delphi case, while both seem very similar, for some reason, and I can't put my finger on it, I can't wrap my head around it, 
But for some reason, the Delphi case seems a little more sinister than the Evansdale case. Yeah, there's going to be more coming out. And I think maybe it's because we know our offender was out on foot, out walking the park, the trails himself. Right. Where Evansdale feels likely to me, especially with these witness statements of this possible vehicle, the suspicious vehicle that was cited, that it was probably more of a snatch and grab situation where somebody was out trolling, looking for a victim and found them. Right. Unfortunately found these two girls and likely if they were out trolling for a victim may find someone, even if they had not spotted Lyric and Elizabeth. That leads me to the next item in the profile. The offender may have attempted to abduct children or adults in the past. This, I think, is an absolute. I think that this is somebody that probably, if it was, in fact, a a stranger-on-stranger abduction, I think that this was somebody that was out trolling looking for a victim and probably went out trolling before and for whatever reason did not, was not successful in obtaining a victim. The other thing, too, that I think is interesting, and I know that age is the hardest factor to determine Mm -hmm. when putting together your profile. Right. And we don't even have any kind of physical description in the Evansdale case other than these possible vehicles, suspicious vehicles. At least in Delphi, we know we're looking for a white male. That's shitty and shady. Let me run some things by you here real quick. Mm -hmm. These are just three off of the top of my head offenders that fit into this this same statement. The offender may have attempted to abduct children or adults in the past. Now, we talk so much about the importance of victimology. Yes, this offender could be out trolling, looking for a child victim. But there are also offenders out there that were known to abduct both adults and children. And so let's go through through one, in fact, is Ted Bundy, known to all of us, whose victims ranged in age from 12 to 26. Now, while he seemed to strongly prefer college-age victims, when he was desperate to find a victim, he would go and seek out younger victims. We know this because in May of 75, Bundy abducted Lynette Culver, age 12. He abducted her from her junior high school in Idaho. Yeah, he could have gone to that junior high school looking for any age of victim, but he's not an idiot. You would think that he had some idea, I might be finding a child victim if I'm going to a junior high school. And then in February of 78, he did it again. Bundy abducted Kimberly Leach, age 12, another 12-year-old, abducted from her junior high school in Lake City, Florida. Now, we know that the rest of his victims were ages 17 or older. And again, most of his victims, he seemed to prefer college-age victims. But then we have somebody that's, that's very similar, Brian Duggan. He was a serial rapist and the killer of three victims. Two of them were young, 10 and seven years of age. Brian Duggan actually committed a crime incredibly similar to the Evansdale murders. When on June 2nd, 1985, Melissa Ackerman and her eight-year-old friend, Opal Horton, were riding their bikes in Illinois when they were confronted by Duggan. He grabbed Opal first and threw her into his car, but the girl managed to escape while Dugan was overpowering Melissa. He later sexually assaulted and killed Ackerman, and her body was located about 15 miles away. She was not found for several weeks. Now, what's interesting to me about that case here, Captain, is both these girls were on their bikes. What did he take, and what did he attempt to take? He took a girl, and he attempted to take the other girl. He did not attempt to take either bike. He was driving a car. You know what I mean? Like, if if we're going to look at Evansdale and say, well, there's a chance that the offender or the offenders took the girls and wanted to conceal the bikes and they placed them there, I don't believe that the girl threw her purse over the fence. I think that was offender behavior. Right. Should we be looking for a car for, for, you know— Dugan didn't have the ability to take the girls and and their bikes because he had limited amount of space in in his vehicle that he was going to abduct them in. Mm -hmm. Then we have John Miller, 
who was responsible for April Tinsley's murder in 1988. He admitted after he was caught all these years later that he drove around frequently and that he picked April at random. And he said that he had gone out on several occasions before and several occasions after he abducted and killed April Tinsley. And he had looked for other child victims during those times. For whatever reason, he didn't take them. Often the simplest reason why he did not take them was because they were not alone. April, unfortunately, was alone when he spotted her. Now, clearly our Evansdale person or persons didn't have an issue with taking two victims, which we is much more risky behavior. Now, one thing that's interesting to me, those are just three examples here. But let's also look at the age of these offenders. Bundy was 27 and two months old when he started his horrific behavior. Brian Dugan was 26 and a half. And John Miller is 28 years old and nine months old. They're all in their late 20s. So in this Evansdale case, you may be looking for somebody in their mid to late 20s. At some point, this behavior goes from fantasy to let's take action and make it a reality. We'll continue on with the offender profile. Following the disappearance, the suspect may have altered his or her physical appearance, such as changing hairstyle and facial hair. The offender's vehicle may have also been altered with a new paint job or reupholstery. And then they go on to say that analysts' experience with prior abduction cases points to one person being involved, but there are cases where more than one person was involved. I'm a little confused by some of their word choices here, Captain. Right. Right? They finish up their profile by stating, our experience is that one person, it all points to one person being involved. One person did this. And I agree with that. That That's well beyond the anything that would suggest that more than one person committed this. And I, I think that that's interesting because throughout their offender profile, they are only referencing one person. During that offender profile, they don't say persons or person, you know, person or persons, right. suspect or suspects. They they constantly reference an individual, and then they finish up their profile by saying, um, "We believe, based off a of prior experience, that one person committed this." So it seems to be, it seems to be a, a thought out choice of of stating just an individual throughout the course of that profile. What is weird, though, too, is the choice of including. She, he or she, several times throughout the course of this profile. Does that mean that they've not ruled out the possibility that that a single woman committed this crime? Well, my issue with this case, and, and, and you could connect it again just to the Delphi frustration. I, I mean, any of these cases, Amy Mihalovic, for example. Good example. Any case that goes... Uh, a time period where law enforcement is just not sharing any information. It's like, I know you have to hold so much back because you need to, I know you have to hold so much back because once you do have a suspect that you want to charge, you have to bring him to trial. You have to bring them to trial. You have to try to get a conviction, but you don't even get them to trial if you don't share some of this information. At this point in your investigation, you're exactly right. Because what you have here is we do know that in the Evansdale case, at least two people came forward with false confessions and they were able to rule those out based off of their hold back information. But you're exactly right. From where I sit here in the garage, what I can see this case, unfortunately, and I hope that none of the families are listening when I say this, this case doesn't seem to be going anywhere. No. It doesn't seem like there's any recent movement on this case. Well, and this case has been unsolved for longer than one of the victims was even alive. Good point. And I don't fault the local law enforcement. I don't fault the persons in charge up to a certain point because they did a lot of hardcore work on this 
case and on this investigation, they involved other agencies, something that we like to see here in the garage. They went as far as to meeting with the FBI and going in front of experts and saying, please, experts, tell us from your expert opinion and your expertise what we should be looking for, how to direct this investigation. I, I love when people are humble like that and they say, help me, help me solve this. Yeah. There's nothing more annoying in these cases when you see these ignorant sheriffs or an ignorant individual that's in charge of an investigation and refuses help or to let any outside sources or resources get involved to help them solve the case that they throw it all on their own shoulders. And then guess what? Nobody gets any justice, but you're right. Captain 10 years later, there's it's a ridiculous. lot of information that it seems like could be released to the public that we could crowdsource some of this. There's a chance that they've interviewed the person or persons responsible in this case. There's a very high probability that that name will appear somewhere in their case file. They just need some help to push this thing to the next step to creating a suspect pool, because it sounds based off of the information that they've released. They don't have a suspect pool. We spent a good deal of time in our previous episodes covering a suspect that the captain and I both agreed we could not get past. We didn't say he did it, but he committed similar crimes and he's a horrible individual. He took his own life. And later law enforcement says they are confident that he's no longer a person of interest in this case. That's the only person of interest we've ever seen publicly announced in this case. Right. He's dead. They're confident he's no longer a person of interest in this case. They wouldn't go into reasons why other than to state that there were forensic things, forensic items that were found that they believe did not connect him to this case. He's forensically, he's not connected to this case. I'm hoping that that means that they have some kind of forensics to eliminate or include certain people in that potential suspect pool. But if you don't have a suspect pool at the moment, now's the time, the 10 year anniversary, shout out from the mountaintops, get all of your local media piece people together and say, we need your help to spread the word on this. We are going to take one last shot. Let's toss up a hail Mary. Hallelujah. And see if we can solve this thing. Right. And that's what we're going to ask of all of you out there listening today. Law enforcement, these families, this community, they need your help. And if you can help, there is a reward, a very substantial reward in this case. Let's prosecute the person or persons responsible for, for this double homicide of two little children. Let's get justice, some form of justice for these girls. Do the right thing. If you have any information at all, anything at all, don't question it. Give it to law enforcement. Let them vet it. Do the right thing. Call 855-300-TIPS. That's 855-300-TIPS. Or 319-232-6822. You could also email any information if you feel more comfortable doing that. Send that information to our missing Iowa girls at dps.state.ia.us. Thank you so much for joining us here in the garage. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and make sure you tell a friend. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful listeners? This week we are recommending Trailed, One Woman's Quest to Solve the Shenandoah Murders by the great Catherine Miles. I got to tell you, we're sitting here and it's getting to be mid to late July. This 
just may be the best true crime book to come out in 2022. You're going to want to check this one out. Again, it's called Trailed, One Woman's Quest to Solve the Shenandoah Murders by Catherine Miles. This is a riveting deep dive into the unsolved murders of two free-spirited young women in the wilderness and a journalist's obsession and a new theory of who might have done it. So check out that great title and many other wonderful recommendations on our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter.